When I was a little kid, my older sister made the claim that gas being released from the anus was flammable. So of course I immediately conducted a scientific experiment to see if this claim was true, and initial testing was quite promising, as it in fact appeared that my colon was producing flammable gas. This quickly led to more experimenting, like were there certain foods or fuels that I could ingest that would produce more of this flammable gas? Beans, cabbage, onions, cauliflower, foods not normally eaten by a teenage boy, were quickly ingested all in the name of science. So in today's video, we're going to talk about why this is actually important. And we'll utilize the cadavers behind me to talk about where and how this gas is produced, and again, why the source of this gas is actually important to you. We'll also discuss potential situations where the gas can cause pain problems, and are there any scenarios where you producing flammable gas could be dangerous? Obviously, this is a very important topic, so let's jump right into this anatomical awesomeness. So I feel like I have to put out a little disclaimer here. I think it goes without saying that playing with fire and flammable substances can be dangerous. Furthermore, using an open flame in the context of my childhood experiments, the external portion of your anus does have surrounding hair follicles. So despite my younger self, I feel like I have to say, don't try these experiments at home. Now, there are multiple names for expelling gas from the anus, the majority of which tend to be slang terms. And because all of us have that teenager inside of us, I'm sure are dying to hear some of these slang terms, let's get this out of the way now so that we can focus on more serious business for the rest of the video. Here are our top 25. So that obviously was not an all-inclusive list. There are lists out there that include over 200 slang terms, so you are more than welcome to include some of your favorite terms in the comments below, but we're going to focus on some of the more medically recognized terms, things like flatus or flatulence, or sometimes I'll just use the term gas. Now flatus actually just means gas, and flatulence is often used to refer to an excessive amount of gas. But how does this flatus or gas get inside of our bodies, or how is it produced? Well, we're going to focus on three different potential sources where this gas or flatus can get into the digestive tract or is produced within. The first is just swallowed air or gas. So when you're eating and swallowing food or just swallowing in general, some of that surrounding air or gas will pass down through the esophagus, and the esophagus just lies posterior or behind your windpipe, the trachea. But as that air or gas moves down the esophagus, some of it will make it into the actual stomach that you can see here. And since that gas came from the air surrounding you, this is primarily going to be made up of nitrogen and oxygen. So a couple of things we need to consider. One, can that swallowed gas even make it through the majority of the digestive tract? Can it make it through 20 feet of small intestine all the way down to the large intestine, which we refer to the colon, and eventually out the anus? And what we find is not much even makes it to the beginning of the small intestine that you can see here. So very little makes it into that small intestine, the majority of which is actually belched or burped out, which the technical term for that is eructation. Now, some of it can actually be absorbed through the inside lining of the stomach and into the bloodstream. This is just another dissection of inside the stomach. And don't get me wrong, this is not a large amount. It's not like you're going to be able to breathe through your stomach. But another thing we need to consider is that nitrogen and oxygen is not considered flammable. Yes, oxygen does help other flammable substances to burn, and it is one of the reactants in the chemical equation of combustion, but it's not directly flammable. And you guys know this from, say, like lighting a match just in your house. This didn't cause some explosion to occur. So another potential source of flatus is produced within the beginning of the small intestine called the duodenum, sometimes pronounced duodenum. But we've already taken a look at this portion, the duodenum, and within the duodenum, carbon dioxide can be produced from the breakdown or the digestion of fats and proteins. It can also be produced from some of the acid making it in from the stomach to the small intestine and interacting with some of the bicarbonate that will be released from the pancreas because the small intestine doesn't like an acidic environment and that bicarbonate is trying to neutralize that acid. But again, we have to ask ourselves, does that gas or that CO2 in this case make it all the way through the small intestine that we've got here and eventually to the large intestine? And what we find is 
not so much. Again, the majority of that CO2 or that gas will get absorbed through the inside lining of the small intestine and into the bloodstream. Now on to the third source where flatus is produced. This actually occurs within the large intestine, again the majority of which is referred to as the colon. And this is where the magic happens. Now we get some help when it comes to producing gas in this region, and this help comes from the bacteria that live within your large intestine, often referred to as your gut flora. Now this gut flora is very important in order for you to produce high quality flatus, and we're going to talk about how this actually works and the specific types of gases that are produced, but first, this is a nice segue for me to say thank you to the sponsor of today's video that supports your gut health, Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is a nutritional company that produces an amazing nutritional drink called AG1. AG1 is made with 75 whole food source ingredients and includes vitamins, minerals, superfoods, adaptogens, and probiotics to help support those little gas producing critters inside your gut. AG1 is also super convenient. All you have to do is take one scoop, dump it in eight ounces of water, shake it up, and dump it down the oral cavity and you're good to go. I take AG1 every day and some of my favorite things about it is that it can help support performance as well as aid in recovery between workouts. And as I alluded to earlier, it can help support gut health by helping maintain the gut flora so that you can have the proper amounts of high quality flatus. AG1 is also NSF certified, which means you can be assured what's on the label will actually be found within the product. To start your order, go to athleticgreens.com slash humananatomy and Athletic Greens will give our viewers a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D as well as five free travel packs with your first purchase. We'll also include the link in the description below. So back to the large intestine. As we mentioned earlier, the large intestine is filled with bacteria and one of the main jobs of this bacteria is to participate in the last part of digestion. So when we ingest food and it moves down to the stomach and starts to mix around within the stomach, we change the name of food to chyme. And as that chyme mixes through the stomach and then moves into this first part of the small intestine that we learned was the duodenum earlier, this is where the majority of digestion has taken place that we can mostly do on our own, within the stomach and the duodenum. And the duodenum is only about 8 to 10 inches long. So that means the rest and the majority of the small intestine is where those digested materials or nutrients are going to be absorbed all the way till we get to the large intestine here. So as that chyme moves from the small intestine into the large intestine, that chyme is essentially left with indigestible carbohydrates or materials. Often we refer to it as fiber. And this is where the bacteria have at it. The bacteria start to break down this indigestible material or fiber through a process called fermentation. And some of the products of fermentation are carbon dioxide, hydrogen and methane. Those last two, hydrogen and methane, being considered flammable gases, or in this case, flammable flatus. So, can your diet influence the amount of this flammable flatus? And how much does the average human produce and expel through their anus per day? Well, let's start with the first question. Your diet can definitely influence the amount. Some foods serve as quite the suitable medium for these flatus forming bacteria especially foods that leave us with plenty of indigestible carbohydrates that are destined to become fermentable, superior foods for your colonic bacteria. Beans definitely live up to their reputation, and there are plenty of other foods that have the potential to increase flatus. Now keep in mind, everyone will respond a little bit differently to these types of foods, things like gut health, genetics, and your specific species of bacteria residing in your gut can influence these types of things. For example, when I'm talking with patients and we're talking about how much fiber they need in their diet, sometimes if they go too far with the fiber or get too much, they can get things like bloating, too much gas, and even some distensional pain there. And so then we'll pull it back the other direction. Getting the right amount of fiber is kind of like the Goldilocks principle. Not too much, not too little, just, just right. Because if you go the other direction and get too little, you can have things like constipation. And what about that answer to the other question of how much gas or flatus is produced in the large intestine per day? And that number is about seven to 10 liters per day. Now that's a lot. Could you imagine if you expelled seven to 10 liters out your anus every single day? That would be horrible for you and frankly for those around you. Luckily, the average healthy person flatulates about 10 to 20 times per day. Now I can just see the comment section going crazy and people comparing their numbers, so do what you want down there, but that equates to about 0.5 to 1.5 liters expressed through the anus per day. 
So you might think, okay, well, where does the rest of that seven to 10 liters go? Well, we've actually talked about this concept previously in the video, and the rest of that will actually get absorbed through the inside lining of the large intestine and into the bloodstream and eventually get expelled through the lungs. And one thing that I should quickly mention because people are likely thinking about it is that hydrogen and methane are technically odorless gases, which means they are not contributing to the stinky smell of flatulence. That comes from the bacteria breaking down other substances. Certain proteins and amino acids that make it into the large intestine will get broken down by the bacteria and certain compounds are formed. One, for example, is called an indole, another scatol, and even hydrogen sulfide. And those are three examples of compounds that you can thank for that stinky smell. And finally, how dangerous can this flammable gas actually be? Well, if you choose to participate in certain risky activities such as pyroflatulence, or my personal favorite name, flatus ignitus, there is a risk for potential injury. You can burn hair follicles surrounding skin. There's been some cases where the flame has actually moved into the anus and a little bit of the colon and ignited some of the gas in there. And there's injuries that are really mild, all the way up to people having to go to the hospital to deal with some of these injuries. But you can actually make the argument that that's self-induced. Why would you do that to yourself? Well, some of us just can't let our curious minds be at ease. But here's an interesting question. Are there any clinical settings or scenarios where flammable gas could be dangerous or a problem? And the answer is yes although it is rare. Some of you may have heard of a procedure called a colonoscopy. A colonoscopy is when a camera or a scope is inserted through the anus and used to explore the colon for cancerous and precancerous lesions. And sometimes they'll find these things called polyps and often remove them with an electrocautery device. Now, if there's high amounts of hydrogen, methane, and enough oxygen, there have been cases where this has ignited and created a small explosion within the colon and caused damage within the colon. Now, again, this is rare. And one of the things we do to reduce this risk is proper bowel prep. Bowel prep is essentially a laxative that helps clear the colon of all the stool or feces so that it can be nice and squeaky clean, if you will, prior to the procedure. Now, some of the older laxatives did contain some carbohydrates that could potentially be fermented by the bacteria and create some of these flammable gases. So it's obviously recommended now to use laxatives that don't contain some of these fermentable carbohydrates, if you will. Another thing that happens during the colonoscopy is that the colon is inflated with actual air. And there's been a move to inflate it with carbon dioxide rather than regular room air because one, people have actually reported less pain when they've been inflated, if you will, with carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is not part of the reactant side of the equation in combustion. It's one of the products. So that would also reduce the risk of any ignition or combustion, if you will, within the colon. So this is not to scare you from getting a colonoscopy. They are safe. These explosions within are very rare, and you just need to do proper bowel prep, go to a reputable medical provider, and then the only flatus ignitus that you would be experiencing is when you participate in irresponsible activities. Thanks for watching, everyone. Hopefully you learned some amazing things about how gas is produced inside your body. If you're interested in Athletic Greens, go ahead and check out that link in the description below. If you feel the need, like, subscribe, comment below, let us know what you want to see in the future, any questions you have, what you thought of the video, and we'll see you next time.